good afternoon namaste and namaskar a grand welcome to all the esteemed doctors delegates and the entire fraternity to experience this striking ecme on role of calcium in women's health i ms sheetal bangar choudhary from mayer vita biotics on behalf of my organization i am pleased to welcome and thank all the delegates who have registered and are attending this seminar with us today mayer vita biotics is the global business partner of vita biotics uk headquartered in london which is uk's number 1 and world's fastest growing nutraceutical company dr kartar singh lalwani is the founder and chairman of vita biotics mayer vita biotics is one of the leading pharmaceutical manufacturer in india mayer has created a unique portfolio of products for addressing the needs of men and women we mayerites take immense pride in showcasing ourselves as the proud makers of calcimax with more than 35 years of legacy in the market and we solely believe in doctor consultation and their prescription we the creators of calcimax has always believed that even if it's calcium it needs a right prescriber and a right prescription to serve the patient rightly being one of the finest choice of prescription we have been serving more than 2 million patients annually our flagship product calcimax offers high potency 500 mg elemental calcium with selenium magnesium zinc vitamin d3 amino acid copper and boron calcimax 500 is the most time tested tested trusted and safe if established formula so today mayer vita biotics provides a unique platform to connect engage and create an avenue towards robust exchange of information on role of calcium in women's health under the guidance of leading and eminent speakers across india with this we shall proceed towards the most awaited panel discussion with amox chairperson dr pratik tambe and our speakers dr gupta and dr suvarna khadilkar so with this i would like to take up the introduction of dr pratik tambe who is md fiicog he is an art consultant and gynecology endoscopy surgeon at ashirwad ivf mumbai he is he has done his international diploma in advanced laparoscopy surgery in france he has been trained in, as an assist he has been trained in assisted reproduction in belgium trained in clinicology clinical embryology and icsi at london and singapore he is a chairperson amox endocrinology committee right from 2020 to 24 his governing council member indian college of obstetrics and gynecology from 2021 to 23 is a patron and ma- managing council member at mox from 2013 onwards acting as a managing committee member at isar 2020 to 24 and managing committee member at maharashtra chapter of isar from 2017 to 19 and 2021 to 23 so with this brief introduction I would like to welcome Dr. Prati, and I would like to hand over the session to him. So, sir, over to you. Thank you very much, ma'am. And let me begin by expressing my gratitude to the Amox office bearers, our beloved president, Dr. Rajendra Singh Pardeshi, our secretary of Amox, Dr. Sujata Dave. I'd also like to express my gratitude to the ICOG office bearers. Dr. Lakshmi Shrikhande, who is our chairperson of ICOG. Dr. Ashok Kumar, who is the secretary of ICOG. Thank you for the ICOG credit point for not only this program but also all the other programs in this series. We have two excellent, eminent chairpersons who are going to be here chairing the sessions today. Dr. Kiran Kurtakoti sir, who is our vice president of AMOG, and Dr. Shobha Gudi, who is the governing council member of the ICOG. We were supposed to have. Dr. Krishnendu Gupta sir, who is the past chair of ICOG, who is going to speak at today's event. Unfortunately, sir is stuck in an emergency and he is in the OT. We don't know if he will be able to make it, but he has very kindly shared his slides, and I'll be happy to present from them. So I'll be the emergency speaker, stand-in speaker, so to speak, in his place. That will be followed by Dr. Swarna Khadilkar Ma'am, who is the past president of the Indian Menopause Society, and she is going to be speaking on menopause hormone therapy and the current evidence. So let me begin by sharing my screen. I have Professor Krishna Gupta's presentation here. I'm assuming that 
and visible and audible. So, sir, was to speak on the role of calcium in women's health. Now, this is something which we take for granted all the time. And we need somebody of the stature of Professor Gupta, who has four or five decades of experience in the entire four or five decades of experience of OBGYN to give us his perspective and his views. So I'll begin by sharing his slides and these are directly from Sir. I think he started off by talking about bone structure. He says that bone is highly specialized supporting framework of the body. It's characterized by its rigidity, hardness, the power of regeneration and a repair. It protects the vital organs, provides an environment for the bone marrow, which, as we all know, is home to a lot of precursor and progenitor cells. It also acts as a mineral reservoir for calcium homeostasis and a reservoir of growth factors and cytokines. It also takes part in acid-base balance. Bone is composed of support cells, which are called as osteoblasts and osteocytes. These are remodeling cells. There are also remodeling cells, which are called as osteoclasts. And there is a non-mineral matrix of collagen as well as non-collagenous proteins, which is called as osteoid. This contains inorganic mineral salts, which is deposited within the matrix. Now, we know that the process of bone formation starts in utero and it continues throughout life. In fact, throughout life, bones undergo a lot of remodeling longitudinal and radial growth as well. The two processes by which bone formation takes place are called as intramembranous and endochondral ossification. I'm sure you'll remember your first and second MBBS days when we were taught this. So this is just a refresher of bone physiology, so to speak, before we start talking about the actual issues involving calcium homeostasis and how the lack of calcium contributes to a variety of issues in women as they age. So there are three steps in osteogenesis or ossification. And these are the synthesis of the extracellular matrix, which we call as the osteoid. There's matrix mineralization, which leads to the formation of bone. And finally, there is remodeling by the process of resorption and reformation. Pictorial depiction of the same, that's intramembranous at the top, and you have endochondral ossification here at the bottom. And remember that these processes start in utero while we are still in our mother's womb and they continue right throughout life up to the moment of death. One key concept that we all need to grasp as far as bone physiology is concerned is bone remodeling. Now, as we said, this is a lifelong process. Old bone is removed from the skeleton. This is a process called as bone resorption. And new bone is added. This is a process called as ossification or bone polish. Remodeling involves continuous removal of discrete packets of old bone. And these are replaced with newly synthesized proteinaceous matrix. Now, this remodeling cycle, of course, requires a lot of coordination, there are a lot of small, small enzymes as well as micromolecules which are going to govern this process and that also requires orderly development and activation of osteoclasts and osteoblasts. Osteoclasts, as we know, are responsible for removing old bone and when there is excess activity of these osteoclasts, you have something called as osteoporosis, which is weakening of the bone. So the bone gets weakened, the cortical bone gets thinner, and the spaces in the spongy bone become larger. So this is just another pictorial depiction of the bone remodeling cycle. We start with three osteoclasts. These become active osteoclasts. There's resorption of the bone, mononuclear cell infiltration. There's reversal, conversion to pre-osteoclasts and this is bone formation, and finally, osteocytes and mineralization phase. So that's the entire life cycle of bone in one single picture there. Now, bone remodeling is what we are focusing on right now. And there are five actual steps which have been identified as far as bone remodeling is concerned. Step one is the activation. Step two is the resorption. 
step three is a reversal, which is actually the end of resorption. Step four is the bone formation via osteoblast. Step five is quiescence. Obviously, these steps, though they have been identified and described, this is a continuous process. This is actually the life cycle of the bone, which is happening 24 7 throughout our life. We've talked about osteoporosis. What is osteopenia? Osteopenia is something which happens as a precursor to osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is when your bone density levels are critical and fractures, for example, fracture of the neck of the femur, which is one of the most common fractures in the perimenopausal and the postmenopausal age group, can happen. So that's when osteoporosis has happened. But osteopenia is a condition where we can identify this weakness of the bone before it reaches critical levels. So here your bone density has begun to dwindle, but still it's not dangerous. It's something which can still be treated and that is where the role of clinicians like you and I come in. You have to step in at the right time and give the right advice to ensure that the patient doesn't advance from osteopenia to osteoporosis. The problem is that this condition is mild and there are no obvious visible symptoms. The osteopenia is something, though it is present in the patient, you will not be able to conduct any physical examination. There won't be any signs and symptoms overtly, which will tell you that this patient has osteopenia, except that you have a high index of suspicion. And then you order the relevant test, which you will come to in just a couple of slides. And those tests are going to identify that this patient has osteopenia and therefore she needs to be treated. The most common cause of osteopenia, of course, in our country is that there is nutrition deficiency, excess sedentary lifestyle, lack of exercise. And in general, what happens is because of a background of lifelong poor nutrient intake, patients develop osteopenia, which of course goes on to osteoporosis. So according to the WHO, osteoporosis is second only to cardiovascular disease as a global healthcare problem. This is something which you and I are aware of, but how many of lay persons, how much of the general public is aware of this? Do you ever see it on any news channel? Do you ever read about it in any newspapers or any Medical focus supplements in newspapers, you rarely see it. In fact, except for the standard World Health Day or International Women's Week, very rarely do we have articles which focus on bone health or issues which are of lay person interest. So, according to WHO, osteoporosis is second only to cardiovascular disease as a global healthcare problem. A 50 year old woman has a similar lifetime risk of dying from fracture of the hip as compared to breast cancer. Now, regarding cancers, of course, there will be a lot of awareness amongst lay people. There will be a lot of articles in the press. There will be a lot of social media awareness. You will see uh, maybe documentaries, you will see films on TV. But osteoporosis, bone health is something which we rarely talk about and you will find that the incidence of death is comparable to that of breast cancer. This is something which is widely prevalent, but still we don't really talk much about it. As far as the prevalence of osteoporosis in our country is concerned, one out of eight men and what one out of three women suffer from osteoporosis, which means that the population, the sum total of women who are suffering from this disorder is one of the largest in the entire world. And the incidence of hip fractures is equal in men and women when you look at the postmenopausal age group. <coughs> Excuse me. As far as the pathogenesis of osteoporosis is concerned, you know that there are three main mechanisms by which osteoporosis develops. The first is inadequate peak bone mass, which, as we said a little while earlier, is because of a background of chronic nutrient deficiency. Second is excessive bone resorption, which means your osteoclasts are hyperfunctional and your osteoblasts are not functioning so well. 
and the last is inadequate formation of new bones during a remodel. So these are the three pathogenetic mechanisms which have been identified as far as osteoporosis is concerned. But what we are here to focus on today and that's the topic of the day is that estrogen, calcium metabolism, vitamin D, all of these have a complex interplay as far as weakening of the bone over time is concerned. We know that in postmenopausal women, estrogen is going to be deficient because the ovaries are packed in. And we said that calcium and vitamin D is deficient in our diets because of a background of chronic nutrient deficiency. Signs and symptoms, as we said, there aren't any visible signs and symptoms in the early stage. Therefore, you need to resort to certain tests, which we are going to describe now. But as the disease progresses, it can cause low back pain, it can cause neck pain, bone pain or tenderness, loss of height over a period of time. You can also see changes in the posture, gait, and you can have pathological fractures of the wrist, hips or vertebrae. So this is how osteoporosis over a period of time will progress. And the tests which we were talking about are these. The most common test is called as the bone mineral density tests. And these are of three types. You can have dual energy X-ray absorptionometry, which is nicely shortened as DXA. The most common test that you and I are familiar with. This is the most accurate test. And this is now the worldwide standard for me measuring bone density. The other tests are mentioned there for your knowledge, but these are not so widely in use. I think all of us are pretty familiar over the past 10 years with this DXA, and that's something which we have subjected most of our patients to. The National Osteoporosis Foundation recommends that all of these women should be subjected to a BMD scan. Number one, all women who are more than 65 years of age irrespective of what are their at-risk factors. Number two is younger postmenopausal women who have one or more risk factors for osteoporosis and hip fractures. Number three is postmenopausal women who are going to present with fractures. So when they have a fracture, it's obvious that they already have osteoporosis and you are just demonstrating that there is a weakness of the bone with your DXA. Probably those are the patients who you are straight away going to start on supplementation because they are the ones who need it the most. You need to pick up women at in group one and group two, which we just talked about, if you are to prevent fractures in these women. Very soon. To calcium, a brief overview. Low calcium causes hyperparathyroidism. It also is supposed to be available in various different salts, so to speak. You have carbonate, acetate, lactate, gluconate, and citrate, of which carbonate is the oldest. And you'll realize that it still even today has the maximum calcium absorption from the GI tract. It's almost 40%. And that has stood the test of time. There are others as well. These are more GI friendly. They cause less GI upsets. They are more palatable to certain patients especially the newer citrate and citrate malate. These are the ones which most of the modern patients like, but you will find that the absorption is still highest with the oldest salt, which is carbonate. It's absorbed from the bowel by vitamin D dependent transport, as we all know, and oral supplementation improves 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations as well as calcium absorption. There is good evidence also to show that higher serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels are associated with better bone mineral density in populations, and there's a linear relationship up to about 75 nanomoles per liter. Obviously, both calcium and vitamin D supplementation is supposed to help women to achieve peak bone mass as well as to prevent bone loss as they age. So when you have a complex interplay of these different systems, in a balanced system, calcium absorption will meet metabolic demands and normal bone mineralization is maintained. Whereas if your calcium and vitamin D levels are low, then your reservoir of bone is going to be depleted and that calcium which is liberated from the bone matrix will correct for the low absorption in the gut. And that's how over a period of time you will have bone weakness, osteoporosis, and osteopenia. Magnesium is another important salt. 
which is present in all of us. It's one of the micronutrients which is present and it's involved in a variety of intracellular processes. But this magnesium, 50 to 60% of it is stored in the bone. And this is very important as far as bone growth, the osteoblast as well as the osteoclast activity is concerned. Deficiency will obviously lead to a preponderance of osteoclast activity and again leads to osteoporosis and osteopenia. Magnesium is also supposed to act on a variety of low inflammatory cytokine, human necrosis factor, interleukin 1, and substance P. All of these have been implicated in increased osteoplastic bone resorption. As we were saying, it's a complex interplay of many molecules. The ones that we are aware of are the ones which we are going to focus on. But there are a lot of micromolecules also, and these are functioning silently in the background. For example, reduced parathyroid hormone and reduced 125-dihydroxyvitamin D3. If they are low, then these are known to be associated with hypomagnesemia or reduced magnesium levels. And again, as we know, that leads to increased osteoclast activity, osteopenia, and osteoporosis. Daily oral magnesium supplementation in young adults induces a transient suppression of bone turnover and that's one of the best examples that you can get that magnesium supplementation is also going to benefit women as far as arresting bone loss is concerned. Zinc is something which we have all prescribed left, right and center. In fact, many of us have popped kilos of zinc during the COVID pandemic thinking that it will boost our immunity, it will prevent the COVID virus from taking over our body. But one of the most important functions of zinc, besides intracellular uh, catalyzing various chemical reactions, is that it functions as a metal component of alkaline phosphatase. This alkaline phosphatase enzyme is important in the formation of new bones. So if your zinc is deficient, besides all the other things which happen, you are also going to have reduced osteoblast activity. Boron is one of those trace elements which are present in all of us. And again, this indirectly and directly affects bone loss and demineralization. Lysine is one of the essential proteins and building blocks of life one of the chief amino acids, the 20 amino acids, which we are all quite familiar with. Lysine helps to increase insulin-like growth factor 1, and this is known to promote osteoblast activity. Therefore, lysine supplementation also helps in these women. Copper is another element which is integral to skeletal mineralization. Selenium is the same, an antioxidant. I'm going to end today's talk with three, four good large meta-analyses, which will prove to you that the presence of osteoporosis and osteopenia is something which is rampant all throughout our practice. We don't recognize it, and supplementation with calcium and vitamin D in these women is going to have significant benefit depending on which route of administration you use and where exactly you are supplementing at what point. So this is a systematic review and meta-analysis. This is published in 2021, very recently. This looks at 20 studies with 15 RCTs. This looks at the role of calcium food fortification. Just like you have iodized salt, just like you have Iodine, which is added to salt, and you also have folic acid supplementation, which is being done in Western countries. They are also looking at supplementing with various other micronutrients. If you supplement with calcium, you make it part of the food fortification program. And this is data from Germany. They found that calcium intake increased significantly in these women, parathyroid hormone decreased, urine to calcium creatinine ratio decreased, femoral neck and hip bone density also increased. And most importantly, as a result of this calcium food fortification program, they were able to prevent hip fractures in older women. As I said, these are all studies from Germany where they have a food fortification program and huge cost savings, 43% cost savings as far as long-term data is concerned.
yes the benefit of calcium supplementation is something which you will realize only once you are looking at large studies and you are looking at long term prospective data this is a good body of evidence as far as calcium food fortification is concerned the next systematic review and meta analysis looks at comparisons of different participants and the age was approximately 78 years the mean 74% of these were women and when they did this network meta analysis they found that calcium and vitamin d supplementation was one of the most important interventions to prevent falls and fractures in older women and this is not published in some chotu journal somewhere this is published in the journal of the american medical association that's the reference for you at the bottom published in 2021 april and you can see that there's a huge number of patients in these trials 1.6 lakhs is a huge number of patients and this obviously is very good high volume data high quality evidence which again goes to prove that simple calcium and vitamin d supplementation goes a long way to establishing bone health preventing fractures in older women one more systematic review and meta analysis is the last one this is published in december of 2020 and this looks at the effect of combined calcium and vitamin d supplementation this is showing that there is a significant increase in bone mineral density lumbar spine dmd arm as well as femoral neck dmd and this is the last and most important sentence on that slide significantly reduce the incidence of hip fractures so ladies and gentlemen over the past 15 20 minutes we have seen that calcium supplementation significantly improves bone health we are also aware that calcium is important in other issues other systemic disorders for example calcium is now being given to prevent preeclampsia this is one such meta analysis which was published in the british journal october 2022 very recent paper 30 trials 20000 women calcium supplementation prevented free eclampsia with high dose as well as a low dose so the actual dose doesn't matter as long as you are supplementing with good dose of calcium you can also prevent free eclampsia in pregnant women therefore as we said it's not only important in bone health but also has significant advantages as far as prevention of preeclampsia is concerned and as we know calcium is an important cofactor in many microscopic cellular processes therefore supplementation of calcium and vitamin d is of paramount importance in your and my daily practice we take it for granted we don't give it its due respect and as i said a little while earlier it has been found to have significant impact in the health of our women in fact india has the largest body of women who are calcium and vitamin d deficient and who are subject who are prospectively subjects who could have fractures notably transcervical fracture and tumor therefore we need to ensure that the right prescription at the right time and ensure that dxc has done is done at the right time in these women so that we pick up these issues apologies again on behalf of professor krishnan mudukta he stuck in the ot and therefore he couldn't present today but he sent me his slides and we are thankful to him for having done the homework i just had to sit and present the talk so thank you again to the amogs office bearers dr rajendra singh pardeshi sir our president dr sujata dave our secretary for this opportunity i see dr suvarna khadilkar madam has joined in thank you ma'am for logging in early if dr kiran kotakoti or dr shubha gudi is there no i don't see them back end team do we have any questions so far in the q and a would you like me to take some questions or we'll do them all later 
Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, we have some questions. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, I already uh, shared with the same on your uh, mail ID. Okay. Also. So we'll do them later. I'll have a look at them in the meantime. Can we have the CV slide for Dr. Suvarna Kardinkar, Madam, please, so that we can formally introduce? Them? I have another webinar to attend uh, immediately. So sorry for. Yes, ma'am. So Dr. Coming. Suvarna Kardinkar is the professor and head at the Bombay Hospital. She's a consultant endocrinologist as well as gynecologist. In the past, she has been chairperson for the Foxy Endocrinology Committee, for which I was also once upon a time a chairperson. She is today the Deputy Secretary General of Foxy. She has also served as the Vice President and Secretary of MOGS. Very soon, she'll be the Senior Vice President in a few days' time. She, is the, she was the Editor-in-Chief of Jogi and she is now the Editor Emeritus. She has been past president of the Indian Menopause Society. Several other academic accomplishments to her name. We are really privileged to have her with us. And she is here today to complete the circle. I have spoken about calcium in women's health. She is going to talk about menopause hormone therapy and the current evidence for the same. Over to you. Thank you. Can I share the screen? Yes, ma'am. Please go. Okay. Okay, uh, so good afternoon. At the outset, I would like to thank MOX President Dr. Rajendra Singh and Dr. Sujata Dalvi and uh, dear Pratik who has been uh, connecting with me, communicating with me regarding this. And I choose my favorite topic. I don't get uh, tired talking on the same topic again and again, but I hope the audience doesn't get uh, bored and tired of listening to me again and again on the same topic. The topic is uh, MHT recent advances. So I won't go much into the details of the physiology and things like that. So what is the current scenario uh, menopause management uh, uh, in the field of menopause management will soon come to know. Let us look at the, uh, you know, the needs and practices of menopause management today. According to 2011 consensus, the total population of India is 1.21 billion out of which almost 48.46% uh, of women, uh, they contribute to total population of India and uh, life expectancy in um, this uh, in Indian uh, females is 72.3 uh, years. So uh, we, and even uh, look at the world uh, statistics also, it's huge. Uh, the projected world population in 2050 is going to be 9.6 billion. So uh, projection of population above 50 years in India uh, in 2050 is 33%. Uh, so imagine how uh, the magnitude of the uh, problem and the number of menopausal women and number of uh, you know uh, years that they will be facing estrogen deficiency and they require the management and care uh, from uh, the experts. Uh, there are basically three major killers in this area, in this age group. A uh, major cause being the cardiovascular diseases. Then there is a burden of low bone mass. We just Pratik, uh, I think, covered. And uh, the burden is 62% at 60 years and 80% at 65 years. And uh, all of us are well aware that 25% of uh, mortality is uh, associated with hip fracture and so we need to really look into the management prevention of post, uh, this postmenopausal osteoporosis and other uh, musculoskeletal problems and uh, there is also steady rise in age adjusted rates of cancer beyond menopause so these three things or these three major killers we have to focus 
prevent, uh, manage and uh, take care of the menopausal symptoms. So what are these menopausal symptoms during and after the menopause transition? So usually uh, uh, the vasomotor symptoms, sleep disorders, mood changes, they begin, they can begin any time after 40 years and they are maximum at around 50 years or the age of menopause, whichever it is. And then they slowly taper around 60 years. Urogenital atrophy and dyspareunia comes in uh, around 50 years onwards and they go on increasing uh, at 60 and beyond. Uh, osteoporosis, atherosclerosis, coronary heart disease and cerebrovascular disease also they go on increasing as the number of age, uh, years uh, increase after the menopause. The menstrual disorders are only in the perimenopausal age that is between a few years before 50 years. So what are the various management options? Uh, we have um, counseling, diet, exercise, uh, non-pharmaceutical options like um, uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, but the, for hormone therapy, there are certain specific indications for hormones like estrogen, progesterone, combined therapies, and other hormones, which we discuss. Three major indications are the first is vasomotor symptoms, vasomotor symptoms and symptom relief. I hope you can hear me. My internet is giving trouble. Are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. No worries. Yeah, yeah. In case you just call me if it gets disconnected. I'm at the hospital, so it may not be at... Uh, you know, uh, uh, good. So common indications are symptom relief, uh, is important indication, urogenital atrophy and uh, bone and osteoporosis. So these are the main things for which hormonal therapy will be required. Uh, after 2002, when the uh, WHO trial uh, reports came, the adverse outcomes that were reported, the WHO trial was uh, stopped uh, at the end of 5.2 years and basically, the risk-benefit ratio of giving menopausal hormone therapy uh, and the or the molecules which were tried in WHI trial, they were unfavorable. So the trial had to be stopped. There were favorable outcomes of uh, in terms of hip fracture, that is osteoporosis was significantly benefited. Colorectal uh, cancer was benefited. The incidence reduced, but the stroke, breast cancer, myocardial infarction they all increased. And in view of that, the WHI trial was stopped. There was a great uh, wave of stopping the uh, MHT across the world. And those women who are already taking also stopped taking it. But our job is to help these women age gracefully. And we uh, have to offer them a quality life uh, those who are suffering from menopause. Even though it is physiological, there are many women who suffer and their quality of life goes down. So we must help them age gracefully. A young woman is a great gift of nature, but an old woman is a work of art. So how do you proceed when a woman of menopausal age comes to you? Anytime, middle-aged, uh, midlife, if a woman comes to you for any reason, so she needs to, uh, you know, take that opportunity, go into the, assess her and go into the details of her history and do the menopausal uh, symptoms in detail. What were the bleeding patterns, etc., whether it's tectomized or no, what contraception she has used earlier, any hormonal intake she has got. Risk assessment is a very, very important thing, which I will go into the details later. But whatever uh, are the comorbid conditions, the risk assessment must be done at midlife so that we can plan out the treatment of uh, hormones or any other uh, medication that you plan to give. You must understand what are the specific risks in a particular patient and accordingly, you should tailor the menopausal hormone therapy for that particular patient. So there can be various comorbidities and there can be various um, uh, treatments available to, uh, you know, select when comorbidity is present or you should avoid giving MHT. Now, family history and current medications and any social significant social personal history and adduction should be noted. And these are the uh, complete uh, examination must be done. 
for abdominal, for speculum, for vaginal examination, pap smear must be done and you should take height and weight, blood pressure, cardiovascular examination, breast examination and thyroid examination. Every woman coming to you, take the opportunity, examine them. Then uh, you do also waist circumference, physical fitness, um, then assessment of mood and cognition and then other specialist uh, referral may be done for eye, refractive index, dental checkup can be done. These are the ideal tests that you must do, uh, but all may not be uh, possible to do each and every test. But it is as per the profile that woman has, you can uh, select and choose and do the thing. But given if she's willing, you can do this, uh, all that uh, list of the whole uh, laboratory test. Complete blood picture, urine test, fasting blood glucose, lipid profile, serum TSH. See, midlife, the thyroid uh, problems are increasing and there is a large uh, number of patients that do already this develop hypothyroidism. So you should do a TSH, pap smear, transvaginal ultrasound uh, and um, uh, mammogram. Uh, individualized after 40 years, whatever is her risk according to that. So at a glance, if you see the health check at menopause, which is a must, the breast examination, ultrasound of uterus and ovaries, BMD test, blood pressure, blood test, pap smear and waist circumference. So if you look at this slide, you know what all tests you should do before you go ahead with menopausal hormone therapy. Now, what are the various options that are available? Uh, yes, in the hormonal therapy, we have estrogen therapy, we have progesterone therapy, we have combination of estrogen and progesterone, androgen therapy, and other hormones like T-bolone or steer hormones, reloxifene, bezidoxifene, or spimephane. These are the uh, options that are available and some of them are useful for certain profile of patients. Some of them are uh, not useful, so you should not use them or they are rather contraindicated you should avoid them. Non-hormonal therapies like clonidine, venlafraxin, propranolol, as the patients are scared of hormonal therapy, they do not wish to take and they are having uh, vasomotor symptoms which is uh, making the life, uh, the quality of life uh, poor, then you can go for a non-hormonal therapy. And uh, however, the, uh, you know, uh, phy phytoestrogens and other plant extracts because they have a role to play in some women where the hormone therapy is contraindicated. So counseling is most important. And when a patient walks into your clinic, you should first address to her concerns and her questions that she has in mind. Our job is to remove the fear from the mind of patient about the menopausal hormone therapy. You provide the educational pamphlets regarding MHT, let her go through it, give her a, a chance to have an informed choice of various hormonal therapies, enhance patient's confidence in decision making. But I feel that you yourself should have be more confident if you wish to impart that confidence to your patient. First, gain you your own confidence because many consultants are not so comfortable and confident to prescribe any MHT. So be sure of what we want to prescribe in a particular patient, various choices. If therapies, uh, after knowing, she will choose a mode of treatment. She may choose non-hormonal, she may choose hormonal, she may choose uh, phytoestrogens or something. And then accordingly, if a therapy is chosen and a hormone therapy is chosen, patient and clinician should agree on the goals, risks, benefits, and whether they are short-term or long-term. Uh, like prevention of diseases associated with aging or uh, both. So that is very important. So you must advise them on the diet and exercise. Uh, many people may not know what is the role of exercise in addition to her medication. She must be encouraged to do exercise. All these are the reasons why physical exercise is important in this age. It maintains healthy weight, improves bone density, improves coordination, balance. It improves muscle strength, joint mobility, and it will prevent the um, you know, falls that you uh, very often see in elderly women. Uh, lipid profile is improved, improves the genital urinary problems, depression is uh, reduced. So there are multiple advantages of doing exercise. So combination of exercises, diet, yoga, 
will help the postmenopausal women to increase her metabolic rate and maintain a healthy weight. Social interactions will help postmenopausal women to improve mood, relieve depression and anxieties. These factors are very, very important and they are not... Um, you know they are the uh, not the only uh, this thing uh, they are not optional but they are mandatory for all uh, patients who require menopausal care so even if she is taking uh, mhd all these have to be uh, followed in spite of she taking menopausal hormone therapy so what are the choices of menopausal hormone therapy the most time tested and the most um, uh, uh, you can say the gold standard is the estrogen and let us see what are the various types, root doses and uh, duration. So three estrogens, E1, E2, E3, the E1 is uh, estradiol, E2 is the most uh, strongest estrogen and estriol is the weakest estrogen. And uh, there are other types of preparations available, 17 beta estradiol, uh, which is identical to the, in, in, uh, almost near identical to the estrogens produced by the ovary. Estradiol valerate, there is a slight modification of a natural molecule, it metabolizes in liver. Conjugated equine estrogens, they have a very, very long therapeutic experience in the world literature and there is, it is a mixture of estrogen sulfate and equine uh, equivalent sulfate from urine of pregnant horses and much lower propensity to induce hepatic adverse effects than the synthetic estrogen. So we don't usually use ethyl estradiol, which is a synthetic estrogen, which has got a very high potency, adverse hepatic effect, and uh, other side effects are much, much higher. So we don't use ethyl estradiol in older patients for MHT, but in very, very young patients in premature ovarian failure, if you need to give, maybe you can give this uh, for a while, but still, we prefer the other estrogen molecules. Now, these are the various molecules and their uh, dosages, but the do estrogen dose counts of dose of 0.625 conjugated estrogen is equivalent, equivalent to 5 to 10 microgram of ethinyl estradiol. Such is the potency of that ethinyl estradiol. And you must uh, see that you must choose the lowest possible dose and the low dose for uh, equine estrogens is 0.3 that is commonly used and ultra low is also available. 17 beta estradiol is 1 milligram and transdermal 17 beta estradiol is about 25 microgram that is the lowest uh, dose. And our today's dictum is use the lowest possible dose of hormones for shortest possible period for the best benefit uh, risk ratio for the women. This is how the estrogens effect. They have a positive effect on the uh, bone mass in the sense they do not increase the bone um, you know, formation, but they prevent the bone loss. I think Pratik has very nicely explained. I won't go into the de uh, details of it. We already know about the actions. And they have a very beneficial effect on lipid metabolism. HDL increases, LDL decreases. So in all, it is beneficial for lipids. Um, then this is about the 17 beta estradiol. We have 2017 North American Menopause Society guidance. And they have uh, put that for women at increased risk of VTE who request MHD, a non-oral route of therapy, that is the transdermal therapy is used at the lowest effective dose is recommended, which I just told you. And hormone therapy increases the VT risk twofold and transdermal uh, estrogen therapy and the natural progesterones actually do not have that kind of risk. So it is, they are considered safer. This is the various comparative uh, data of the equivalent dose. I won't go into the detail. This is about the transdermal MHT does not modify the marker of coagulation more favorable for serum triglycerides. It doesn't increase incidence of stroke and these are uh, eliminates hepatic first, uh, first pass metabolism. So all these are beneficial, but uh, in India, it is little difficult. We have uh, various uh, preparations like patches, pessaries, creams, and gels. Now, newer product is estradiol spray, where 0.06%, 1.25 gram per day is the single approved dose for the treatment for moderate to severe uh, vasomotor symptoms. Estradiol gel can be used for mild symptoms. Two meter dosages can be used. Uh, 1.5 milligram that will be enough and this tube will last for 26 days so 
these are the various serum levels of estradiol and estrone with different dosages and you must uh, uh, have an optimum levels to have the best effect. What is the type of progesterone, which is the choice? Uh, see, the progesterone therapy has gone nearly uh, from 1960 to 1980. And then we have uh, from US, the estrogen alone was started. They were non-hysterectomized uh, women, but still they used estrogen alone. They realized that it causes estrogen, um, uh, high, uh, causes hyperplasia and endometrial cancer. And then they added uh, in Europe they, and US, both they started adding progesterone. Now we know uh, that uh, adding a particular molecule of progesterone will increase the risk of breast cancer and other, uh, 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 you know, other diseases. So what is the ideal HRT? It should include a progestin molecule which protects the endometrium and it does not reverse the positive effects of estrogen on CBS. So progesterone of effects on CBS are, uh, you know, that medroxy progesterone, which is at high doses for cyclical administration, it will abolish the beneficial effect of estrogen. Yet lower if, uh, doses of MP, however, continuous combined regimen, no effect was observed. And dihydrogestron and natural uh, micronized progesterone, they, have, they are devoid of androgenic effect and they do not reverse the beneficial effect of estrogen. So they are now considered safer than the medroxy progesterone acetate. So we, these are the various types of progesterones which you can use even the... Uh, micronized progesterone and dihydrogesterone both have a cyclical or continuous the dosages are given here 10 milligram and 300 or 20, 200 milligram they are considered safer uh, options for progesterone addition and they also maintain the endometrium uh, do not they do not cause the endometrial hyperplasia and the prevention of hyperplasia is very very effective with both these progesterone molecules so type of progesterones and igf1 level as you can see the progesterone if you add like dihydrogesterone the igf levels are dropped mpa also they are dropped but not as much as dihydrogesterone and therefore non endogenic progesterone uh, like cyproterone acetate dihydrogesterone uh, counteracted the IGF-1 decrease in the women treated with CE. So you can see here that uh, uh, the chart is showing the same effect. So dose of oral and vaginal micronized progesterone, the uh, international uh, panel recommendation, I have already discussed, sequential progesterone endometrial protection will happen if given sequentially for at least 12 to 14 days a month at 200 milligram per day for up to five years and vaginal micronized progesterone also at least 10 days a month 4% 45 milligram per day every other day at 100 milligram per day for three to five years. So these are the various guidelines. These are the various progesterones and they have found that giving progesterone whichever type uh, MPA as uh, causes the uh, the, the, it does not lead to endometrial hyperplasia. Now, why higher breast cancer with progesterone? Because androgenic progesterones cause increase in IGF-1 level, reduction in SHBG level. So, there is an increase in the risk of breast cancer. Whereas, the natural micronized progesterone and other progesterone, they do not cause this. So, what is at fault? You must know when you give patients start having side effects. So if there is a breast tenderness, bleeding, then reduce the estrogen dose. If there is irritability, depression, water retention, reduce the progesterone dose and change the progestogen. I hope you can hear me, right? I'm not sure about my net. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Suvarna. We can hear you, see you very clearly, loud and clear. Okay. Okay, thank you. Because in between my internet shows uh, unstable uh, indicator. Anyway. So mm. this is how it is effective and it is well tolerated with no bleeding and it protects the endometrium very, very effectively. Uh, vaginal progesterone, uh, twice weekly progesterone gel applied vaginally, more drug reaches. So it is preferred to give vaginally. Lesser dose is required to act on the endometrium and lesser systemic side effects. So you can uh, prefer vaginal over the oral. Now I'll skip a few slides because of the lack of time. 
and uh, the the result is that giving progesterone it definitely stops or reverses the hyperplasia of estrogen and it protects the endometrium and there are no increased risk of endometrial cancer lh iud is a wonderful option the reason is that uh, oral uh, estrogen can be given if there is an intact uterus uh, instead of giving uh, systemic progesterone which is having side effects you can choose to put in a lng iud which will prevent hyperplasia and may produce negative uh, sometimes it produces negative mood effects now in covid times we have to know if there is a confirmed covid 19 women who are already using mht serious hospitalized patient always uh, you should withdraw systemic mht and add low molecular weight heparin at prophylactic doses outpatients if mild symptoms, withdraw MHT and switch to transdermal MHT. And if there are uh, outpatient persistent respiratory symptoms that require only outpatient monitoring, if using MHT, transdermal, switch to transdermal MHT and add prophylactic LMWH. So these are various options when the patients are having uh, confirmed. These are the options for suspected COVID. But I am so happy that nowadays we see less number of patients who are COVID positive so let's go to the comorbidities that affect women we must know what are the various comorbidities uh, these are the whole list of comorbidities various cancers like breast endometrial ovarian cervical cancers osteoporosis and various cardiovascular morbidities cerebrovascular morbidities diabetes dementia ob uh, obesity dyslipidemia so for that what do you do Every patient who is subjected to uh, menopausal hormone therapy, let them go through several risk assessment models. Now, we have one uh, risk assessment model of vasomotor symptoms that is menopause rating scale. And this menopause rating scale will objectively tell you whether patient really requires MHT or no and how severe are the vasomotor symptoms. Then you go uh, according to the score, you decide whether it is mild, moderate, severe, accordingly you decide which menopausal hormone therapy she will need. Then according to BMI, obesity, waist circumference and visceral obesity can be assessed. And depending on that, you assess her obesity risk. Cardiovascular diseases, there is a WHO ISH risk assessment uh, tool is there where hypertension, cardiovascular disease is assessed. And then you decide what is the risk of developing cardiac disease in the patient. OSTA is the osteoporosis risk assessment, WHO fracture risk assessment tool. All of you know FRACS. It calculates the 10-year uh, risk of development of fracture ahead. Muscle health is similarly assessed by a tool called SARC-F. A five-item questionnaire is there. Alzheimer's disease, endometrial cancer, VT, and diabetes. They have their specific list of risk factors. And you must assess them, put them in the risk factors and find out if she's at a high risk of developing. And accordingly, either you will choose a particular molecule or not choose a particular molecule. Breast cancer risk assessment is uh, very, uh, you know, there are several tools available. Online models like Gale model is very uh, easy to use online. If you go and see, you can calculate your own risk of breast cancer. And then you go ahead and have an informed consent regarding uh, whether you want uh, uh, um, uh, want to go ahead with the uh, menopause hormone therapy, which is a safer molecule uh, of uh, progesterone, which is linked with it. Don't use uh, medroxyprogesterone, but instead you may go for natural progesterone if you are at a higher risk. But it is if it is a higher risk, it is preferable to uh, not use the molecules rather than go for an other mole molecules. I think I will, this is the MRS scale. I'll just skip through the slide just to give you idea. This is how you rate the symptoms, vasomotor symptoms, and you will divide into mild, moderate, severe, and then choose. This is the WHO ISH 10-year risk of combined myocardial infarction. Depending on your uh, blood cholesterol, blood pressure, then this is a chart that you will have. Then this is a risk assessment of cardiovascular disease. You divide them into low, moderate, high and avoid MHT if you have high risk. Give transdermal MHT if you are moderate risk and low risk, you can go ahead with MHT. And uh, MHT is not indicated for primary or secondary prevention of comorbidities. 
like uh, cardiovascular disease. So these are various uh, baseline risks for VTE that you can choose. Whenever high risk of thrombophilic disorders are there, do not use MHT. Normal or low risk, you can use transdermal or tibolone. This is the FRAX. And we have a Asian specific uh, uh, FRAX model because this is uh, going with the ethnic models are available. So we have Asian where that you should use for your own country. Then this is a DEXA that is available for all postmenopausal women. More than five years of menopause should be subjected to DEXA. Postmenopausal women less than five years, but there are risk factors like parathyroid disease, any other disease which causes less bone mass. You must do it earlier also. Women in menopause transition with secondary causes. And if there is a evidence of osteopenia and already compression fracture, you should do DEXA so that you can follow it up later. Other options like Tibolone, which has gone out of market, but it is again come back. And now, which was considered as very safe drug, except for you can't use it for a previous breast cancer's uh, history and breast cancer survivors you don't use because it is known to recur. So 2.5 milligram or even 1.25, half the dose is very, very effective. So how it is given, these are three regimes. If uterus is not there or is strictomized woman, use only estrogen. If uterus is intact, if she is perimenopausal, use estrogen uh, continuous sequential MHT. She will have cyclical bleeding. If you use continuous combined MHT for a postmenopausal woman, she will not have a cyclical bleeding. And that's how you choose the regime with estrogen progesterone. I'm going to skip through this recent evidence. I don't know if time permits, I can go because they are all important scientific materials which are um, you need to know and find out. Pratik, do I have time or I should stop? Plenty it? of time, ma'am. Plenty of time. Please go ahead. Please go Plenty on. Plenty of time. Enjoy. Okay. So, you are all enjoying your talk. Okay. 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 There is, I, I thought you all must have got tired of listening to me again and again. No, no, actually. Anyway, so these are the various <laughs> recent papers. Okay. These recent evidence which really helps us make a decision also at consultant level. So there are uh, arterial imaging outcomes in cardiovascular diseases in recently menopausal uh, women. And uh, this uh, has shown that four years of early MHT, like if you start immediately after patients uh, get menopausal, they did not affect the progression of atherosclerosis despite improving some markers of cardiovascular disease. Kronos or KEEP study is Kronos early estrogen prevention study where they have tried three regimens and the results with early MHT were that there was no effect on progression of atherosclerosis, low LDL, decreased LDL and high increasing of HDLC. So beneficial effects were uh, continued. Then uh, there was a reanalysis of nurses health study where number of women were 1,21,000 and 700 nurses were, uh, the results were reanalyzed afterwards. And now we have the, the concept of window of opportunity. And women who started MHT soon after menopause had a reduced risk of CH uh, coronary heart disease compared to those who started treatment later, which was the case in your uh, WHI. So choose the cases in the window of opportunity when your vessels are healthy, your estrogen receptors are very, very, uh, you know, receptive and they will respond to the hormonal therapy and do not wait for them to uh, get worse. So after they get worse and if you give MHT, they will have all side effects. Hormone therapy and venous thromboembolism among postmenopausal women uh, impact uh, Impact of the root of estrogen, that is the Easter study reports, risk of thromboembolism associated with different progesterones was shown here. You will see that uh, micronized progesterone and norpregnant, nor, uh, norpregnant or uh, this oral estrogen and norpregnant had a higher uh, this thing, whereas micronized progesterone and uh, pregnant derivatives have uh, no significant association with uh, uh, VTE uh, risk. VTE risk. Now, there is a DOPE study or Danish Osteoporosis Prevention Study published in 2012. This was a uh, sample size of small, but 1006, but 10 year follow, a uh, 16 year follow for, uh, you know, EPT for 10 years. 
So their conclusion was there was no apparent increase in risk of cancer, VT or stroke, and there was significant decrease in the mortality and in hospitalization for MI and CHFs. So that is a significant study, but sample size are small. So each study has got some positive and some negative. Finnish cohort study says that estradiol didrogestron was not associated with significant increase in the incidence of uh, breast cancer. So some, some relief that we get. And, uh, you know, it is at least five years data says that in 50,210 women, that if you go more than five years, maybe there is uh, increased risk. But within five years, there is no increased incidence of breast cancer. So again, we can be more confident in giving MHT for less than five years or shortest possible period. Less gynecological risk with 17 beta estradiol and didrogestron. So the uh, this study provides evidence that the risk of developing cancers with estrogen and didrogestron used for several months to few years is uh, without uh, is uh, is similar to the risk of developing gynecological cancers without HRT or use of other HRT. And it is a large study population, 69,412 women. So there are various recommendations from various guidelines, but essentially they have the same, uh, they speak the same language. That is, MHT is the most effective therapy for vasomotor sy symptoms. MHT must be individualized and tailored according to symptom administration of individualized MHT, including androgenic preparation when appropriate, may improve both sexuality and overall health of midlife. And these are the various guidelines. So age of initiation must be within 10 years of menopause or less than 60 years of men age. So this is what is window of opportunity and you can't use it beyond 60 years and don't use it after 10 years of attaining menopause. Duration can be, uh, uh, you know, as much as in patients with premature menopause as much as the natural age of menopause. So uh, by say Indians, uh, 48, uh, 6, 48 is the age. Till that time you can use your um, MHT and uh, then three to five years here and there, and then you can go. So most of the guidelines, they are in consensus that you must uh, use the MHT in window period, in shortest possible, uh, in smallest possible dose, and shortest over the shortest possible period of time in a healthy condition, you will attain the best benefit out of it. So to conclude, the menopause management has gone through various phases over the last several years, various ups and downs, uh, and uh, universal MHT is far gone by and nobody uses it. And you have to use it very, very judiciously, but confidently. And research is ongoing in this field, but currently the MHT is recommended for symptomatic relief and is to be used for shortest possible duration in the smallest possible dose to minimize the risks involved. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you. Sorry for joining late, Sona. This is Dr. Kiran Kurkoti. But uh, Hi, Kiran. I appreciate, hi. I appreciate and Pradeek, really thank you so much for this particular uh, talk of Dr. Suvarna because believe me, it was a masterclass. You know, there are certain topics, you know, that they, they, they you know, you leave them as options or they are bouncers. So similarly, <laughs> menopause is a topic which, which we not uh, very frequently uh, address to. But thank you, Dr. Suvarna. I mean, uh, really, it was mind boggling. And especially if you could uh, share the FRAX uh, Indian data or the FRAX Indian website, then probably we can link it to the MOS website. And so that, you know, still Indian that. has not come. Asian, we have to use Asian. Oh, fine, fine, fine. But thank you so much. And I would really love to see your presentation being shared at the MOS website. Pratik, if it is possible, if there is no, uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, Property rights involved, then Suvarna can share her presentation. We share the link of the video for today's program. Yeah, sir. you can that do can that. Be shared no really. If anybody wants to view it again in case they've missed it. There are already 4,000 people logged in. But in case anybody has missed it, <laughs> and we can always share the video for today's program. Thank you so much. I think Prati, Dr. Shubha and everybody, you all are doing great job. I must appreciate your work. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Is Dr. Shubhagudi there, ma'am? Okay. I can see her logged in. Maybe she's traveling because I don't see her video. There are some questions 
which are there in the if you could take my link. questions then that i can just quickly shift to the other webinar <laughs> yes ma'am so there is one question and that is from dr shukla from from kanpur yeah so the question is which is to be preferred is it menopause hormone therapy or calcium supplements i think they both go hand in hand there is <laughs> they can't be uh, they have to be put together that's why i said ki even counseling there is no choice counseling diet exercise calcium vitamin d and if required mhd mhd can be optional if patient is not having symptoms but all these are mandatory Yes, ma'am. I think that's the only relevant question for you. There are some questions for the calcium talk as well. In case you're getting delayed, then we're very happy to have you with us. Thank you yeah. so much for Thank joining you so us. Much. Bye. Wishing all the very best. Thank, Thank you. you so all the best. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank so you. The next question is from Dr. Sanjeev Tolne from Nasik. And he's asking, does supplementation with calcium and boron improve BMD in postmenopausal women? Overwhelming answer is yes. I showed three meta-analysis with nearly 2 lakh patients yes, cumulative from all those three meta-analyses, which shows that yes, BMD does improve, reduces the incidence of fractures and BMD not only in one site, but BMD at multiple sites. Uh, neck of the femur, humerus, arms, legs, and the standard ankle, which everybody does. So at multiple sites, it improves. Dr. Mohan Babu from Vellore is asking, can calcium and boron supplementation improve symptoms of arthritis in women? Again, the overwhelming answer is yes. Dr. J.B. Sharma from Delhi is asking, why is it better to consult a doctor before starting any calcium supplement and how consuming calcium without consultation can be harmful? So calcium is something which we all take for granted, but it must be stressed that you need to visit a doctor. The doctor needs to assess you, assess the suitability for starting calcium in your case. And of course, you can buy OTC, that is over-the-counter supplements, but then the quality may not be assured. Bioavailability may not be good. There may be a lot of impurities in it. And remember that he said that there are multiple different salts of calcium. Each of them have their own absorption and bioavailability. Whatever you buy OTC, though it is packaged as calcium, may not necessarily contain the right dose for you, may not have the right purity, there may be impurities. Again, the bioavailability is not something which can be guaranteed. And another question is asking Dr. Vijay Shukla from Lucknow, can you address the misconception of OTC drugs being more readily available than prescription drugs? I don't think that is the case. If you go to a doctor and you say, doctor, I would like to start calcium supplementation. Can you prescribe the right brand for me? Or can you prescribe the right formulation for me, which has the best effect on my body in the short and the long term? I'm pretty sure that no doctor is going to say, no, don't start calcium in your case. They will examine you. They will see that which is the best preparation for you and what is the right dose for you because not one size fits all in medicine. Dr. Kishan Kumar Mahalik from Bhuvaneshwar is asking which medications are contraindicated with the concomitant use of calcium. Now, as is widely known, iron is something which interacts with calcium, so both have to be taken at different times. But there are other drugs as well which interfere with calcium absorption or calcium interferes with their absorption. That includes beta blockers, diuretics, medications which are anti-epileptic in nature. You can also have antacids, laxatives. All of these are supposed to interact with calcium. Also, some medications which are taken for lowering cholesterol, and that's relevant, of course, in the postmenopausal age group. Those patients may have multiple issues at the same time. They may be popping a lot of pills in a short space of time. So whenever you are taking your beta blockers or your diuretics, that's a heart medication, you need to have at least two hours gap. Again, the same is true for anti-epileptic medications, and so on and so forth. Can, why is it? Next question Yeah, is from Dr. Swati Singh Bhuvaneshwar. What special precautions need to be taken by calcium-consuming geriatric population? I think we've already talked about this. 
last question is from Dr. Shweta Jaiswal. She is from Delhi. What happens when calcium supplements are taken without lifestyle modification or seeking medical advice? I think Dr. Suvarna Kadrika put it very nicely. One of the last things she said before she left, and that is that it has to be a holistic approach. Everything has its own place. It cannot be only this or only that. There needs to be diet, there needs to be exercise, there needs to be lifestyle modification. You need to have the appropriate micronutrient formulations which are going in. Again, you need to ensure that you have good exposure to sunlight. This is something which I never get tired of saying that in a country which has more than 300 days of sunshine in a year, India has one of the largest populations which are vitamin D deficient because we don't get exposed to sunlight at the right time. It's the afternoon, 12 to 2 p.m. When the sun is at its brightest directly overhead, that is when you need to be exposed to have the benefit of vitamin D. Otherwise, the early morning sunlight, which we've been taught, is not really beneficial as far as conversion is concerned. And yes, one last question, which has just popped in, is calcium self-medication in pre-existing heart conditions? Ampere? I think we talked about this just a minute or two ago, that diuretics and beta blockers, both of these interact with calcium, and though calcium is something which we all take for granted, we know that obviously calcium channel blockers layer into calcium when you take it is going to interfere with the action of calcium channel blockers. Again, when you take diuretics, you know that the diuretics are going to cause excessive excretion of calcium in the urine and therefore all these heart medications you need to inform your cardiologist or your doctor who is looking after you that you are also on calcium supplementation similarly if your gynecologist or your family physician has put you on calcium supplementation then you need to inform them that you are also taking other medications what are the medications and then they will appropriately calculate the dose for you space it out and tell you most likely that you need to keep a gap of at least two hours between taking your calcium as well as taking the other medications. So that's the end of the Q&A. I think there are no further questions. If there are any comments from anybody, I will request you to speak before I propose the formal vote of thanks. Anyone, Dr. Kiran Kurtakoti, sir, Dr. Shobha Godi, I think Dr. Suvarna has already left because she has another event to go to. Backend team, any more questions or anything else you would like to communicate? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I just uh, sent another mail uh, for several questions. Uh, you can check. Uh, just let me have a look. Audience, please bear with me while I check the mail again. Okay, I'm not seeing the email. Maybe it will take some time. Yes, sir, it check will take some time. Minute. It will take some time. I'll, yeah. I'll check again in a minute. I think today was a very good program where we had a lot of attendees. We had a lot of good key take-home messages. And as I keep saying, calcium and vitamin D is something which we take for granted. And we don't really talk much about it, but it's something which is a very important component of women's health. Calcium and vitamin D work on almost every single cell in the human body at a microcellular level. Vitamin D is a cofactor in many of the reactions which occur at a microcellular level. And therefore, ensuring that we examine all our women who are at risk for fracture in the perimenopausal age group and assessing their DXA status is of paramount importance. We need to start these patients on supplementation at the right time. And we of course need to assess their importance Yeah, so there are some questions which calcium is absorbed quickly. So as we said, there are multiple different salts and there are certain newer molecules or newer formulations which are more easily absorbed. But then, of course, 
we know that the age old calcium carbonate is the one which works best as far as bioavailability is concerned. What is the normal T3, T4 value in pregnancy? I am chairperson for the Morgan Endocrinology Committee, so that's a very relevant question. But then that's something which we will talk about in one of our later events. Very soon, we're going to be talking about thyroid hormones and their values in pregnancy, the deficiency in pregnancy, the subclinical hypothyroidism issue, and we will have an endocrinologist talk about that. So stay tuned to that. What is the maximum dose of calcium? So according to literature, greater than 2.5 grams is not recommended because we know that at that level it can cause vasoconstriction of vessels lead to hypertension lead to deposition of calcium plaques in the vessels and that can itself lead to ischemic heart disease so a level greater than that is not recommended i think that's the end of the question so if anybody has anything else to say i don't think so is uh, sheetal there sheetal do you want to come back in and do you want to Say a formal goodbye to our audience before I present the vote of thanks, or should I go ahead? So, please go ahead. All right, so let me close today's event with the formal vote of thanks as the chairperson for the MOGS Endocrinology Committee. This was Dr. Pratik Pande. Today's event was on the role of calcium in women's health. I'd like to express my gratitude to our AMOGS president, Dr. Rajinder Singh Pardeshi, our secretary of AMOGS, Dr. Sujata Dalvi, the ICOG chairperson, Dr. Lakshmi Shri Khande. I would request you to go ahead. Yeah. The ICOG chairperson, Dr. Lakshmi Shri Khande, the secretary of ICOG, Dr. Ashok Kumar, thank you so much for the ICOG credit points. We had Dr. Kiran Kurtakati, sir, despite his busy operation theater schedule, he popped in for a few minutes and he gave us a few important pearls of wisdom. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Sir is, of course, the vice president of Amongst. Dr. Chobagudi, I think, was on the road and unfortunately she couldn't join us for that reason. We didn't have much input from her, but I'm sure she enjoyed today's event just like all of you in the audience did. We had two fantastic speakers today proposed Dr. Krishnendu Gupta, our past chairperson of ICOJ. Unfortunately, he was stuck in DOT, but he very kindly conveyed his slides to us, shared his slides with us, and therefore I was able to stand in as a speaker with him for him. And last but not least, Dr. Suvarna Khadilkar, our past president of the Indian Menopause Society, she placed the occasion and gave an extensive oration on menopause hormone therapy, most updated and current evidence for the same. I'd also like to express my gratitude to our back-end team, Science Integra, Subhu, Ganesh, everybody else who's done a lot of hard work behind the scenes to coordinate this program, bring it to you. My gratitude also to Mayor Vita Biotics, makers of Calcimax 500, Calcimax 4. Sheetal, who is the product manager, is here with us. Thank you for starting the program off and getting the ball rolling. We look forward to more such events with you. By you, I mean all of you in the audience. This is the experience series with Science Integra and Dr. Pratik Kandu. Until next time, goodbye. Hello, Pratik. Take care. Hello, Pratik. Hello. Hello. Yes, Am I yes Dr. Shobha. Yes, you are audible. You are audible. We are just presenting yeah, the yeah. vote of thanks. We were waiting yeah. for you. Yeah. 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 I, no, no. Actually, I had joined in. I had joined okay. in. Okay. But I was not able to interact. I listened to all the wonderful session, Pratik, and wishing you many more like this. I really liked the lecture by Dr. Suvarna because that is what I was listening to. <laughs> I was not able to do anything more. I'm so sorry. But it Not was really enjoyable. Thank you. We'll so have much. you next time. Thank uh, you so much the, for joining. Yeah, yeah. And the interaction was really good, done. A lot of interest from the audience. Yes, so ma'am. That Thank shows you so that much. you are reaching. You are reaching out to people. And yes, we've got 4,000 plus in the audience. <laughs> great. So we have great. a fantastic audience today, despite yes. it being a weekday afternoon. Yeah, that is what. Thank so you so much, Prati, for, for, uh, for inviting me. Thanks a lot. Yes, and sorry Thank I could you so not much contribute for more. Not at all, ma'am. Sorry, time. I could not contribute. Okay, no thanks. thanks. So until next time, goodbye, God bless. All the very best to all of you. See you soon.